Lord, we need you. In the midst of the trials that we face in our families and in our different circumstances, Lord, we need you. And we know that you're always faithful to be a very present help in a time of trouble. God, I pray that you'd bless the word tonight. God, I pray that uh, it would be fruitful and yet you would accomplish your perfect will and glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated uh, tonight. Thank you, singers, even though they're already down. They beat me to it. <laughs> amen. If I seemed a little if I seemed scatterbrained tonight, I apologize. I did not intend to be. But I have um that boy loves his mama, don't he? Amen. If he's got his mama, he wants his daddy. If he's got his daddy, he wants his mama. He can't make up his mind what he wants. But I didn't get my nap today, so I'm gonna try not to be scatterbrained and all over the place. But uh, I don't know that we'll continue this permanently, but I know last week we preached on a a subject of eschatology, the study of end times, and tonight we're going to be doing that again. If you've been around me long enough, you know I, I love to talk about this stuff, so whenever the Lord will allow me, uh, I, I don't argue with him. I like to do it, and so um, we'll see. I can't promise that Sunday nights will turn into in times night it may it may not you'll just have to come wondering and guessing amen but uh one thing been around me long enough to know is that uh i'm gonna do what the lord tells me to because as soon as i tell you i'm gonna do a series the next week the lord's gonna tell me to do something else so i try not to uh I try not to make those false claims because if I do it enough, people start claiming I'm a false prophet. <laughs> well, I'm not prophesying, but you get what I'm trying to say. But uh, if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 tonight. And uh, we're going to be talking, the Lord willing, about Gog and Magog and the battle of Armageddon. Now, there's two things that I want to, you know, Perhaps dispel here at the beginning. Um, and everything I try to do, I always say, let's, even when I, my end times study uh, series is entitled, The Antichrist Revisited No uh, Preconceptions Allowed. Um, I think that it's beneficial when you do any kind of study to let scripture speak to you. Uh, instead of you speaking into the scripture. Uh, it needs to be the other way around. Um, but two things that have been prevalent in end time studies, at least modern end time studies, uh, end time studies that have been Eurocentric have only been recently uh, uh, adapted for most of, well, I don't know that I can say most of, but for a large portion of time, uh, in the church history, uh, our church fathers have held similar beliefs than I have. Um, I believe that uh, Islam is the religion of the Antichrist. I believe that uh, the Antichrist will be the Muslim 12th Imam, the Imam al-Mahdi, their savior they're looking for. I make no bones about that. That's what I believe. That's something the Lord spoke to me 16 years ago before I had ever even done an ounce of study into the end times and before I even knew that Islam had a savior. That's what God told me. And so um, I've not just went with that. I've looked into the scriptures and that's what it bears out. But people have looked at Ezekiel 38 and there's this idea that an attack before the tribulation or even maybe perhaps in the beginning of the tribulation, an attack is going to come against Israel and that God will supernaturally defend Israel during that attack and draw back her enemies. Um, and people look at this as though it is some kind of, it is a second, um, a separate thing from the battle of Armageddon. 
And a lot of times people believe that Russia will, who is Gog, they believe Russia is Gog or Magog, will be the perpetrator of that attack. I don't believe that. And uh, I always want to throw these things out here that I may be wrong. I don't think that I am. If I thought I was wrong, I wouldn't be saying it. <laughs> but, um, you know, end times is not a salvation issue. Now, since we're in the end times, I think it's very important that we understand it. Uh, and the book of Revelation is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the more we understand the book of Revelation, the more Christ is revealed to us. So I think it's important for us to study. But throughout the history of eschatology, Russia has normally played a major role uh, in many people's interpretations. And we see uh, Russia being uh, a major player on the world stage right now and growing. Uh, now, this idea turned even greater in the 70s and, and 80s because Russia at the turn of the century turned communist and for a long time was the only other superpower in the world, the great enemy of the United States and an enemy of God for that matter. And the spread of communism seemed to be further fulfillment of the scriptures. But then the Soviet Union collapsed and people started wondering, okay, how does Russia play a role now that, it colla that it's collapsed? Now due to Russia's size and still powerful position in the world, there's no question about it that she is going to play a role uh, in the end times. Uh, the present leader, Vladimir Putin, is a very evil man. But similar to America, there are no scriptures which speak of her or her involvement specifically. Now, a symbol of the Soviet Union was the bear. Now, a lot of people think that, okay, it's the symbol of the Soviet Union is the bear. Now let's look, see, it's in the book of Daniel, the bear. But you can't look at it from our modern perspective. You have to look at it from the perspective of Daniel's time and what that apocalyptic uh, symbolism represented to the people in that, in, in that time frame and from their prism. In the Bible, any time that it mentions the bear, it is always in reference to Media Persia not to communist Russia. Communist Russia did not exist or wasn't even, maybe it existed, but it wasn't, well, it wasn't communist. Russia existed. There were people that were living there, but it was not a player on the world stage at the time that Daniel was writing this. And the bear, even Daniel plays this out, represented media Persia, which is now today, present day Iran. Now, uh, in the book of Ezekiel 38, a lot of people think that Russia will attack Israel with overwhelming force, but that God will supernaturally protect her. Let's look at, um, and I'm going to have to guess with you on some of these things because I told you I'm scatterbrained. I didn't mark on my notes which one of these things have slides, so we're just going to have to guess about these slides as we go. Lord, help me tonight. But Ezekiel 38, chapter, uh, chapter 38, verse 1 through 6, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and I will turn thee back. And put hooks into your, thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth and all thine army, horse and horsemen, all of them clothed with all manner of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persian, Ethiopian, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all of his bands, the house of Targuma, the north quarters and all of his bands, and many people with thee. Now the idea has been from this scripture, that Russia with an Arab coalition is going to attack Israel, but that God will supernaturally protect Israel and put a hook in their, the enemy's mouth and draw them back away. Now I think, and I hope that you'll see in just a few moments, that that is a, a misrepresentation of the scriptures. Now, many see Meshach and Tubal as ancient names from Moscow and Siberia. Now listen, 
Uh, there is some historical evidence that they bore some of these names or names that were very similar to them. But there are a lot of places in the Bible and throughout world history that are named the same thing. And the fact of the matter is, Israel may call this nation one thing, but another nation may call it something else. So if you look at maps from this area and then maps from this area, they'll have different names for different leaders and different rulers. We see that in the Bible a lot of times where there seemingly is contradictions with the names of rulers where rulers were known by many different names. And we're going to see that in a few moments. Now, God, now, the leader of these places is Gog. The leader of Meshach and Tubal is Gog. So a lot of people think that, the, that Gog is the leader of Russia. But Gog is not the leader of Russia. Gog is the Antichrist. He's a type of the Antichrist. He's who, he, he, he is a, uh, a device that's being used to illustrate the Antichrist in the future. And the names, I want you to get this, Meshach and Tubal don't refer to any city in Russia either. Meshach and Tubal were sons of Japheth, grandsons of Noah, and their descendants settled in Asia Minor, which today is modern-day Turkey, which was the seat of the Ottoman Empire, which was the climax of the Muslim Empire that came after the fall of the Roman Empire. Now, if you looked on a map, and I don't have a map to show you tonight, but you can look it up. You can Google it when you get home or Google it on your phone right now. Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, Targovmoth, all of these names that were mentioned in Ezekiel 38, all of these are cities within Turkey. They're not variations of the name. They're not extensions of the name. There are cities that are named specifically in exactly these names in Turkey. Now, many scholars, take it for what it is with that. Some scholars are good, some scholars are bad. Believe that Gog is the same man as Gaius, G-Y-G-E-S. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. And here's an example of leaders having different names that he could have been called Gog, he could have been called Gaius, but he was also called by the Assyrians Gugu of Luda, Lud, Ludu, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing those names wrong, but G-U-G-U. So this one guy has all these different names. Gaius was the first of the Murnad dynasty of Lydian kings. He ruled between 716 B.C., in 678 B.C., Ezekiel lived and prophesied somewhere between 622 B.C. and 570 B.C., so he would have been very familiar with the king who consolidated power in Asia Minor, who consolidated the power of Meshach and Tubal being the chief prince of these areas. Now, according to Josephus, who was a historian of that time, Jews identified Gog with the Scythians or the Sifs. And according to modern scholars, the Scythians and the Sifs were of Turkish origin. One of the major forms of worship was the worship of men, M-E-N, and men was the moon god. Now, the moon god of Turkey in that area was depicted often with a crescent moon between his shoulders. The religion of men was later combined with the Semitic moon god Sin under the Akkadian Empire. Now, I know I'm throwing out all these crazy names, but here's why it's important, because I want you to see that Gog is the leader of a moon-worshipping nation, which is today a modern Arab Muslim moon god worshiping country. Now, I've taught on this before that Allah is the moon god, and we won't go back into all that, but I just wanted you to see those parallels. But in Ezekiel 38, God tells Ezekiel to focus on Gog in the land of Magog, which is Turkey. The purpose of this focus 
is to prophesy against the land. In verse number three, God explicitly tells Magog, this land, that he is against it. In verse four, God tells Gog, the leader of this land, that he will cause him to return by putting uh, a katal or a nose ring into their jaw, just like the Assyrians did when the Assyrians came and drew the Jews into captivity. They put rings in their noses and in their lips and led them away by chains. That's what God says he's going to do to Gog. He's going to force him to come to return. But my question is this. Where is he going to return to? Is this a retreat? As some people would say. Is he going to have to return back to where he's going? Or is it something else? Now as we continue in verse number 4. We see that God will bring Gog Yatsa or forward, that word means forward, with all his armed army. Now the countries that are in his army are Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, which is the Sumerians, Targamar, which is modern Turkey. All of these countries, some bearing the exact same name today, are modern Muslim nations. So God is going to put hooks in the jaws of these Muslim nations and cause them to return and come forward for a certain purpose. Now we see the purpose of this attack in verse number 8 of Ezekiel 38 and 8. I'm skipping it. I could have helped you guys out with all these names. I told you I didn't know what I was doing with this slideshow. Amen. But in verse number 8, we see in many days, after many days, thou shalt be visited. In the latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. Hold on to that. That's important. And is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely all of them. Now, in the end times, Gog will be mustered up with all the other countries listed and come into a land. That word land in the Hebrew is Eretz, and it means a country. So they're going to be mustered together into a country that is revived from the sword. So are, you, are your antennas going off right here for a minute? Because this will be the same country or empire, the, deadly, the beast whose deadly head wound was healed in the book of Revelation 13. It's the revival of an empire that was and is, was and is not, but will be to come. And I know I mixed all that together, but you know what I'm trying to say. Now, the empire that came after the Roman Empire and has been the only empire that has continued to some extent has been the Islamic Empire. It was under many different caliphs and many different caliphates. Um, the biggest and strongest form of it, the most consolidated form of the empire was the Ottoman Empire that was destroyed and seemingly put to death and divided up after World War I, received a deadly head wound. I believe that the Islamic Empire will be, it's seemingly been destroyed, it's seemingly been divided, it's going to be restored, and it already is right now being restored under the Islamic Caliphate. And it's going to be all of these nations binding together into a land or a country being revived from the sword. Now, as we... Uh, now, it... it it adds to this, sorry, that Turkey is actually was the seat of power for the Ottoman Empire. Now, these attackers are gathering together against Israel, who has been revised, revived as a nation from Jews fleeing 
persecution. Now, let's look at the king of the north. The purpose of these attacks is to utterly destroy Israel. Ezekiel tells us the origin of this attack is from the north and is specifically tied to Daniel chapter 11, verse number uh, 30. Um, 6 through 45. Now, let me read these scriptures. And these are pretty lengthy, but this is probably the most lengthy version. I think it's important. Ezekiel 38, 9 through 16. Thou shalt ascend and come like a storm, and thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. He's talking to Gog here. Thus saith the Lord, it shall also come to pass that at that same time shall things come into thy mind, and thou shalt think an evil thought. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages, and I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take a spoil and to take a prey to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations. This is the Jewish people, which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarish, and all the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away the silver and gold, to take away the cattle and the goods, to take a great spoil? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it. And, when, and thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army, and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a, as a cloud covereth the land. Now shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee out against my land, and the heathen may know me, and I shall be sanctified in the old Gog before their eyes. Now, parallel passage to this is Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, verse number 36 through 45. And the king, tell me if this doesn't sound the same, and the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that, is, for that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any God for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. And thus shall he do in the most strongholds with the strange God, and whom he shall acknowledge increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into their countries and shall over oh, and pass over. He shall return unto the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall, not, but these shall escape out of his hand even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall not have power over the treasuries of gold and silver, over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. Now, the country of Turkey is located directly north of Israel. When the Bible speaks of a king of the north and of the south, 
Egypt is the king of the south. Syria is the king of the north. But he's specifically talking in greater ideas of the Grecian Empire, which turned into the Ottoman Empire to the north by its relation. In Daniel 11.40, we see that Egypt will be attacked, but he be defeated just as we saw in, uh, well, no, just as we will see in later lessons. Then the king of the north, who is Gog, will attack Israel. Now, in Ezekiel 38, verse 17, Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I shall, would bring thee against them? So God is saying to Gog right now in verse 17 that his coming has been foretold a long time ago by the prophets of Israel. Now, in my opinion, it's becoming increasingly clear and will become clear even more in just a few moments that, the, that Ezekiel 38 is not talking about a separate battle, but is in fact talking about the battle of Armageddon. Concerning the battle of Armageddon, we know that as the Antichrist gathers his armies together against Israel in the Jezreel Valley, that God is gathering his armies together in heaven. We see this in Revelations 19, 11 through 14. And I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he was judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his, on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written therein no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean." Just in case you didn't know it, you get to be in that army if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Amen. We may not get to kick the devil in the face in this battle, but we're going to get to kick the Antichrist in the face. Amen. Or at least get to watch Jesus do it. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But as Gog, who's the Antichrist, gathers against Israel and God gathers his armies in heaven, Ezekiel Plant, paints the same picture as John the Revelator. In Ezekiel 38, verse 18 to 20, he says, And it shall come to pass that at the same time when God shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fail, fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Now we know that the Antichrist wars against the Jewish people when it seems like he's getting ready to prevail, that Jesus Christ is going to split the eastern sky. And he, Joel said in chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, that he saw him coming to execute with ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So he's splitting the eastern sky coming with tens of thousands of his saints. Now, that word ten thousands upon ten thousands, it's a literary device to show multiplicity. It's going to be a multiplicity of millions of angels and saints coming back with Jesus Christ. But we won't be there, I don't believe, to help him in the fight. We'll just be there to watch him because he's not going to need any help because all he's going to do is open up his mouth. And here's the next part. He's going to slay the armies of the Antichrist by opening up his mouth and a sword's going to come out. He's going to speak the word and they're going to die. We see that in Ezekiel 38, verse 21 and 22. 
and I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilences and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon the bands and upon many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Revelations 19 talks about the sword going forth out of his mouth. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, Ezekiel 39, which is a continuation of 38, establishes further ties to this battle of Armageddon. Because in Ezekiel 39, verse 1 through 3, it says this, Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and leave thee but the sixth part of thee and cause thee to come up to the north parts and bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. And I will smite thy bow out of thy left hand and will cause thine arrows to fall out of thy right hand. Now, I like that part because in verse number 3, Christ is telling him that he's going to smite the bow and arrows out of his hands. Well, who do we see with a bow and arrow? We see the Antichrist in Revelation 6. And I saw, behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow and a crown and was given unto him. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Well, I hate that. Well, I don't hate to tell it. I enjoy to tell it. That one day he's going to go for the Antichrist is going to go forth conquering and to conquer. But when he comes up against the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to smack the bow and arrows out of his hands and he's going to be defeated. And his conquering will come to an end. Hallelujah. And after the battle, we know that the Blood will run 180 miles in all directions as high as the horse's bridle. After the battle, an angel calls the birds and the fowls of the air to come and eat the flesh of the dead. That's in Revelations 19, verse 17 through 21. But guess what? It also says that in Ezekiel 39, 4 through 9. Thou shalt fall upon the mountains of Israel, thou and all thy bands and the people that is with thee. And I will give thee unto the ravenous bir birds of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. Thou shalt fall upon the open field, and I will send a fire on Magog and upon them that dwell carelessly in the isles, and they shall know that I am the Lord. And so will I make my name holy, known in the midst, my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. And I will not let, let them pollute my holy name any more. And all the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Behold, it is come and is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire and burn the weapons, shields, both shields and bucklers, the bows and the arrows and the hand staves and the spears. And they shall burn them with fire seven years. Revelation 19, 17 to 21, and I saw the angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and flesh of captains and flesh of the mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sat thereon and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with the false prophet that were wrought miracles before him and he was deceived them that had wrought the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. And these were both cast into the lake of fire and it goes on. And the, all the fowls were filled with their flesh. But I really like this part. It's probably my favorite correlation between the two. Ezekiel 38, 23, at the end of it all, then I will magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. At the end of all of this, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be exalted. He's going to set his foot on the Mount of Olives. The mountain is going to 
rip in two. And he's going to set his throne in the midst of that mountain. And the nations are going to come before him to be judged. And he is going to be exalted. He is going to be the ruler of this world. And after the millennial kingdom is done and Satan's been loosed for a season and he's defeated and his armies burned up by fires out of heaven, the scripture says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's a parallel passage. I can't remember what chapter, but it's in the book of Isaiah. That every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess and it continues on. It says, Nebo shall bow and Baal will stoop. Nebo and Baal were moon gods. I, I, this, the moon god himself, Allah, who is Satan, is going to have to bow the knee to Jesus Christ and confess that he is Lord. The exaltation or the revelation of Jesus Christ is what these final seven years of tribulation that are coming are really all about. Christ is revealing himself to the world and to the Jewish people. See, Christ came the first time as a suffering Savior. But the next time he returns, he's coming back a conquering king. And I wish my slideshow would have been, I wish I'd have been able to put this up there in the right way for you tonight. Because it would have helped you see the parallels between these verses better than me reading them. But what I wanted you to see tonight in my opinion, Gog is not the leader of Russia. And the battle of Ezekiel 38 is the same thing as the battle of Armageddon. Gog is the Antichrist. I believe he's a Muslim ruler. Every single nation that you see fighting against Christ in the last days, every single nation is today a Muslim nation. And most of them worship the moon god, the crescent moon. To me, the parallels are just too coincidental. But all of them will one day be defeated by Jesus Christ, who will be exalted forever. Amen. How many is looking forward to that day? He's going to be exalted forever. And it's going to be then that he's going to wipe away every tear from your eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. And here's something I'm really looking forward to. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he's going to make all things new. Amen. How many is looking forward to that day? Well, there'll be no more heartaches, no more fears, no more tear stains. No more death, no more parting, no more goodbyes. It's all going to pass away. I'm going to get a new back. Annie, you're going to get new nerves. If you, if you have nerves, a nervous system in your glorified body, you're going to get new nerves that ain't going to be damaged by shingles. There won't be no shingles in that glorified body, will there? Sister Karen, you're going to get a new back. Bobby, you're going to get a new stomach. You ain't going to have no more stomach problems. Amen. Chad, you ain't going to have no more diabetes. You're going to be able to eat whatever you want to eat. Johnny, you're going to be able to eat whatever you want to eat and not gain a thing. <laughs> Glory. Right? Amen. I, I'm catching up with you, brother. I'm right there. All right. Johnny, you won't ever even have the threat of cancer again. Glory, I could go to all of us. There won't be no more sickness and no more pain. We'll be in the presence of him forever. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise tonight. He's going to be exalted, amen. Hallelujah. Father, we just worship you. We thank you for your presence tonight. We thank you for your word. I pray, God, that you would illuminate it, that it would be understandable to your people. God, I believe that through a proper understanding of the end times that you will be fully revealed in all of your power and majesty. God, I pray that you would just continue to lead God and direct us as a church body to play whatever role we need to play in these last days. And God, I just pray for a blessing upon my people and for safe travel for them home, God. 
And Lord, the different things that we're facing and struggling with right now, the different attacks of the enemy that are coming against the people. God, even the seducing spirits that are drawing perhaps even some away. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would raise up a standard against the enemy. That no weapon formed against us shall be able to prosper. God, I pray that you would put an end to all deceit and all confusion. Lord, I pray that we would hear your voice, recognize the voice of our shepherd and not follow another. And we ask all these things in the precious and mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen.